Dedication and Preface to Don Quixote, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Don Quixote, Volume 2 By Miguel Cervantes de Saavedra Translated by John Ormsby Dedication of Volume 2 to the Count of Limos. These days past, when sending your excellency my plays, that had appeared in print before being shown on the stage, I said, if I remember well, that Don Quixote was putting on his spurs to go and render homage to your excellency. Now I say that with his spurs he is on his way, should he reach destination, methinks I shall have rendered some service to your excellency, as from many parts I am urged to send him off, so as to dispel the loathing and disgust caused by another Don Quixote, who, under the name of Second Part, has run masquerading through the whole world. And he who has shown the greatest longing for him has been the great emperor of China, who wrote me a letter in Chinese a month ago, and sent it by a special courier. He asked me, or, to be truthful, he begged me to send him Don Quixote, for he intended to found a college where the Spanish tongue would be taught, and it was his wish that the book to be read should be the history of Don Quixote. He also added that I should go and be the rector of this college. I asked the bearer if His Majesty had afforded a sum in aid of my travel expenses. He answered, No, not even in thought. Then, brother, I replied, you can return to your China, post-haste, or at whatever haste you are bound to go, as I am not fit for so long a travel and, besides being ill, I am very much without money, while emperor for emperor, and monarch for monarch, I have at Naples the great Count of Limos, who, without so many petty titles of colleges and rectorships, sustains me, protects me, and does me more favor than I can wish for. Thus I gave his leave, and I beg mine from you, offering your excellency the Trabajos de Persiles y Sigismunda, a book I shall finish within four months, Deo Volente, and which will be either the worst or the best that has been composed in our language, I mean of those intended for entertainment, at which I repent of having called it the worst, for in the opinion of friends, it is bound to attain the summit of possible quality. May your excellency return in such health that is wished you. Persilis will be ready to kiss your hand, and I, your feet, being as I am, your excellency's most humble servant. From Madrid, this last day of October of the year 1000, six hundred and fifteen at the service of your excellency miguel de cervantes saavedra the author's preface god bless me gentle or it may be plebeian reader how eagerly must thou be looking forward to this preface expecting to find there retaliation scolding and abuse against the author of the second Don Quixote. I mean him who was, they say, begotten at Tordesillas, and born at Tarragona. Well, then, the truth is, I am not going to give thee that satisfaction, for, though injuries stir up anger in humbler breasts, in mine the rule must admit of an exception. Thou wouldst have me call him ass, 
fool and malapert. But I have no such intention. Let his offence be his punishment. With his bread let him eat it, and there's an end of it. What I cannot help taking amiss is that he charges me with being old and one-handed, as if it had been in my power to keep time from passing over me, or as if the loss of my hand had been brought about in some tavern, and not on the grandest occasion the past or present has seen, or the future can hope to see. If my wounds have no beauty to the beholder's eye, they are at least honourable in the estimation of those who know where they were received. For the soldier shows to greater advantage dead in battle than alive in flight. And so strongly is this my feeling, that if now it were proposed to perform an impossibility for me, I would rather have had my share in that mighty action than be free from my wounds this minute, without having been present at it. Those the soldier shows on his face and breast are stars that direct others to the heaven of honour and ambition of merited praise, and, moreover, it is to be observed that it is not with grey hairs that one writes, but with the understanding, and that, commonly, improves with years. I take it amiss, too, that he calls me envious, and explains to me, as if I were ignorant, what envy is. For, really and truly, of the two kinds there are, I only know that which is holy, noble, and high-minded, and if that be so, as it is, I am not likely to attack a priest, above all, if, in addition, he holds the rank of familiar of the holy office. And, if he said what he did, on account of him on whose behalf it seems he spoke, he is entirely mistaken. For I worship the genius of that person, and admire his works and his unceasing and strenuous industry. After all, I am grateful to this gentleman, the author, for saying that my novels are more satirical than exemplary, but that they are good, for they could not be that unless there was a little of everything in them. I suspect thou wilt say that I am taking a very humble line, and keeping myself too much within the bounds of my moderation, from a feeling that additional suffering should not be inflicted upon a sufferer, and that what this gentleman has to endure must doubtless be very great, as he does not dare to come out into the open field and broad daylight, but hides his name and disguises his country as if he had been guilty of some lee's majesty. If perchance thou shouldst come to know him, tell him from me that I do not hold myself aggrieved, for I know well what the temptations of the devil are, and that one of the greatest is putting it into a man's head that he can write and print a book by which he will get as much fame as money, and as much money as fame. And to prove it, I will beg of you, in your own sprightly, pleasant way, to tell him this story. There was a madman in Seville who took to one of the drollest absurdities and vagaries that ever madman in the world gave way to, it was this. He made a tube of reed, sharp at one end, and, catching a dog in the street, or wherever it might be, he with his foot held one of its legs fast, and with his hand lifted up the other, and, as best he could, fixed the tube, where, by blowing, he made the dog as round as a ball. Then, Holding it in this position, 
he gave it a couple of slaps on the belly, and let it go, saying to the bystanders, and there were always plenty of them, Do your worships think now that it is an easy thing to blow up a dog? Does your worship think now that it is an easy thing to write a book? And if this story does not suit him, you may, dear reader, tell him this one, which is likewise of a madman and a dog. In Cordova there was another madman, whose way it was to carry a piece of marble slab, or a stone, not of the lightest, on his head. And when he came upon any unwary dog, he used to draw close to him, and let the weight fall right on top of him, on which the dog, in a rage, barking and howling, would run three streets without stopping. It so happened, however, that one of the dogs he discharged his load upon was a cap-maker's dog, of which his master was very fond. The stone came down, hitting it on the head. The dog raised a yell at the blow. The master saw the affair, and was wroth, and snatching up a measuring yard, rushed out at the madman, and did not leave a sound bone in his body. And at every stroke he gave him, he said, You dog, you thief, my lurcher, don't you see, you brute, that my dog is a lurcher? And so, repeating the word lurcher again and again, he sent the madman away beaten to a jelly. The madman took the lesson to heart, and vanished, and for more than a month never once showed himself in public. But after that he came out again with his old trick, and a heavier load than ever. He came up to where there was a dog, and, examining it very carefully without venturing to let the stone fall, he said, This is a lurcher. Where? In short, all the dogs he came across, be they mastiffs or terriers, he said were lurchers, and he discharged no more stones. Maybe it will be the same with this historian, that he will not venture another time to discharge the weight of his wit in books, which, being bad, are harder than stones. Tell him, too, that I do not care a farthing for the threat he holds out to me, of depriving me of my profit by means of his book. For, to borrow from the famous interlude of the Perendenga, I say in answer to him, Long life to my lord the Veinticuatro, and Christ be with us all. Long life to the great Conde de Lemos, whose Christian charity and well-known generosity support me against all the strokes of my cursed fortune, and long life to the supreme benevolence of his eminence of Toledo, Don Bernardo de Sandoval y Rojas. And what matter if there be no printing presses in the world, or if they print more books against me than there are letters in the verses of Mingo Revulgo? These two princes, unsought by any adulation or flattery of mine, of their own goodness alone, have taken it upon them to show me kindness and protect me, and in this I consider myself happier and richer than if fortune had raised me to her greatest height in the ordinary way. The poor man may retain honor, but not the vicious. Poverty may cast a cloud over nobility, but cannot hide it altogether. And as virtue of itself sheds a certain light, even though it be through the straits and chinks of penury, it wins the esteem of lofty and noble spirits, and in consequence their protection. Thou needst say no more to him, 
nor will I say anything more to thee, save to tell thee to bear in mind that this second part of Don Quixote, which I offer thee, is cut by the same craftsman and from the same cloth as the first, and that in it I present thee Don Quixote continued, and at length dead and buried, so that no one may dare to bring forward any further evidence against him, for that already produced is sufficient, and suffice it too that some reputable person should have given an account of all these shrewd lunacies of his without going into the matter again. For abundance, even of good things, prevents them from being valued, and scarcity, even in the case of what is bad, confers a certain value. I was forgetting to tell thee that thou mayst expect the Persiles, which I am now finishing, and also the second part of Galatea. End of the Dedication and Preface to the Second Volume of Don Quixote Read by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California For LibriVox Spring 2007Don Quixote, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Don Quixote, Volume 2, by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. Translated by John Ormsby. Chapter 1. Of the interview the curate and the barber had with Don Quixote about his malady. Sidi Amiti Benengeli, in the second part of this history, and third sally of Don Quixote, says that the curate and the barber remained nearly a month without seeing him, lest they should recall or bring back to his recollection what had taken place. They did not, however, omit to visit his niece and housekeeper, and charge them to be careful to treat him with attention, and give him comforting things to eat, and such as were good for the heart and the brain, whence it was plain to see all his misfortune proceeded. The niece and housekeeper replied that they did so, and meant to do so with all possible care and assiduity, for they could perceive that their master was now and then beginning to show signs of being in his right mind. This gave great satisfaction to the curate and the barber, for they concluded they had taken the right course in carrying him off and chanted on the ox-cart, as had been described in the first part of this great as well as accurate history in the last chapter thereof so they resolved to pay him a visit and test the improvement in his condition, although they thought it almost impossible that there could be any, and they agreed not to touch upon any point connected with knight-errantry so as not to run the risk of reopening wounds which were still so tender. They came to see him consequently and found him sitting up in bed in a green baize waistcoat and a red toledo cap and so withered and dried up that he looked as if he had been turned into a mummy they were very cordially received by him they asked him after his health and he talked to them about himself very naturally and in very well chosen language in the course of their conversation they fell to discussing what they call state craft and systems of government, correcting this abuse and condemning that, reforming one practice and abolishing another, 
each of the three setting up for a new legislator a modern Lycurgus or a brand new Solon, and so completely did they remodel the state that they seem to have thrust it into a furnace and taken out something quite different from what they had put in. And on all the subjects they dealt with, Don Quixote spoke with such good sense that the pair of examiners were fully convinced that he was quite recovered and in his full senses. The niece and housekeeper were present at the conversation and could not find words enough to express their thanks to God at seeing their master so clear in his mind. Curit, however, changing his original plan, which was to avoid touching upon matters of chivalry, resolved to test Don Quixote's recovery thoroughly and see whether it were genuine or not. And so, from one subject to another, he came at last to talk of the news that had come from the capital, and, among other things, he said it was considered certain that the Turk was coming down with a powerful fleet, and that no one knew what his purpose was, or when the great storm would burst, and that all Christendom was in apprehension of this, which almost every year causes to arms and that his majesty had made provision for the security of the coasts of Naples and Sicily and the island of Malta. To this Don Quixote replied, His majesty has acted like a prudent warrior in providing for the safety of his realms in time, so that the enemy may not find him unprepared. But if my advice were taken, I would recommend him to adopt a measure which at present, no doubt, His Majesty is very far from thinking of. The moment the curate heard this, he said to himself, God keep thee in his hand, poor Don Quixote, for it seems to me thou art precipitating thyself from the height of thy madness into the profound abyss of thy simplicity. But the barber, who had the same suspicion as the curate, asked Don Quixote what would be his advice as to the measures that he said ought to be adopted, for perhaps it might prove to be one that would have to be added to the list of the many impertinent suggestions that people were in the habit of offering to princes. Mine, Master Shaver, said Don Quixote, will not be impertinent but, on the contrary, pertinent. I don't mean that, said the barber, but that experience has shown that all or most of the expedients which are proposed to His Majesty are either impossible or absurd or injurious to the king and to the kingdom. Mine, however, replied Don Quixote, is neither impossible nor absurd, but the easiest, the most reasonable, the readiest and most expeditious that could suggest itself to any projector's mind. You take a long time to tell it, Señor Don Quixote, said the curate. I don't choose to tell it here now, said Don Quixote, and have it reach the ears of the lords of the council tomorrow morning, and some other carry off the thanks and rewards of my trouble. For my part, said the barber, I give my word here and before God that I will not repeat what your worship says to king, rook, or earthly man, an oath I learned from the ballad of the curate who, in the prelude, told the king of the thief who had robbed him of the hundred gold crowns and his pacing mule. I am not versed in stories, said Don Quixote, but I know the oath is a good one because I know the barber to be an honest fellow. Even if he were not, said the curate, I will go bail and answer for him that, in this matter, he will be as silent as a dummy, under pain of paying any penalty that may be pronounced. And who will be security for you, senor curate? said Don Quixote. My profession, replied the curate, which is to keep secrets. Odds body, said Don Quixote at this, 
what more has his majesty to do but to command by public proclamation all the knights errant that are scattered over spain to assemble on a fixed day in the capital for even if no more than half a dozen come there may be one among them who alone will suffice to destroy the entire might of the turk give me your attention and follow me is it pray any new thing for a single knight errant to demolish an army of two hundred thousand men as if they all had but one throat or were made of sugar paste nay tell me how many histories are there filled with these marvels if only in an evil hour for me i don't speak for any one else the famous don bedellianis were alive now or any one of the innumerable progeny of Amadis of Gaul. If any of these were alive today, and were to come face to face with the Turk by my faith, I would not give much for the Turks' chance. But God will have regard for his people, and will provide some one who, if not so valiant as the knights errants of yore, at least will not be inferior to them in spirit. But God knows what I mean, and I say no more. Alas! exclaimed the niece at this, may I die if my master does not want to turn knight errant again. To which Don Quixote replied, A knight errant I shall die, and let the Turk come down or go up when he likes, and in as strong force as he can, once more I say, God knows what I mean. But here the barber said, I ask your worships to give me leave to tell a short story of something that happened in Seville, which comes so pat to the purpose just now that I should like greatly to tell it. Don Quixote gave him leave, and the rest prepared to listen, and he began thus. In the madhouse at Seville, there was a man whom his relations had placed there as being out of his mind. He was a graduate of Osuna in canon law. But even if he had been of Salamanca, it was the opinion of most people that he would have been mad all the same. This graduate, after some years of confinement, took it into his head that he was sane and in his full senses, and under this impression wrote to the archbishop entreating him earnestly and in very correct language to have him released from the misery in which he was living for by god's mercy he had now recovered his lost reason though his relations in order to enjoy his property kept him there and in spite of the truth would make him out to be mad until his dying day the archbishop, moved by repeated sensible, well-written letters, directed one of his chaplains to make inquiry of the madhouse as to the truth of the licentiate's statements, and to have an interview with the madman himself, and, if it should appear that he was in his senses, to take him out and restore him to liberty. The chaplain did so, and the governor assured him that the man was still mad, and that though he often spoke like a highly intelligent person, he would in the end break out into nonsense that in quantity and quality counterbalanced all the sensible things he had said before, as might be easily tested by talking to him. The chaplain resolved to try the experiment, and obtaining access to the madman conversed with him for an hour or more, during the whole of which time he never uttered a word that was incorrect or absurd, but, on the contrary, spoke so rationally that the chaplain was compelled to believe him to be sane. Among other things, he said the governor was against him, not to lose the presents his relations made him for reporting him still mad but with lucid intervals and that the worst foe he had in his misfortune was his large property for in order to enjoy it his enemies disparaged and threw doubts upon the mercy our lord had shown him in turning him from a brute beast into a man 
In short, he spoke in such a way that he cast suspicion on the governor, and made his relations appear covetous and heartless, and himself so rational that the chaplain determined to take him away with him, that the archbishop might see him and ascertain for himself the truth of the matter. Yielding to this conviction, the worthy chaplain begged the governor to have the clothes in which the licentiate had entered the house given to him. The governor again bade him beware of what he was doing, as the licentiate was beyond a doubt still mad, but all his cautions and warnings were unavailing to dissuade the chaplain from taking him away. The governor, seeing that it was the order of the archbishop, obeyed, and they dressed the licentiate in his own clothes, which were new and decent. He, as soon as he saw himself clothed like one in his senses, and divested of the appearance of a madman, entreated the chaplain to permit him in charity to go and take leave of his comrades, the madmen. The chaplain said he would go with him to see what madmen there were in the house. So they went upstairs, and with them some of those who were present. Approaching a cage in which there was a furious madman, though just at that moment calm and quiet, the licentiate said to him, Brother, think if you have any commands for me, for I am going home, as God has been pleased in his infinite goodness and mercy, without any merit of mine, to restore me my reason. I am now cured and in my senses, for with God's power nothing is impossible. Have strong hope and trust in him, for as he has restored me to my original condition, so likewise he will restore you if you trust in him. I will take care to send you some good things to eat, and be sure you eat them, for I would have you know I am convinced, as one who has gone through it, that all this madness of ours comes of having the stomach empty and the brains full of wind. Take courage, take courage, for despondency in misfortune breaks down health and brings on death. To all these words of the licentiate, another madman in a cage opposite that of the furious one was listening, and raising himself up from an old mat on which he lay stark naked, he asked in a loud voice who it was that was going away cured and in his senses. The licentiate answered, It is I, brother, who am going. I have now no need to remain here any longer for which I return infinite thanks to heaven that has had so great mercy upon me. Mind what you are saying, licentiate. Don't let the devil deceive you, replied the madman. Keep quiet, stay where you are, and you will save yourself the trouble of coming back. I know I am cured, returned the licentiate, and that I shall not have to go stations again. You cured, said the madman. Well, we shall see. God be with you. But I swear to you, by Jupiter, whose majesty I represent on earth, that for this crime alone, which Seville is committing today in releasing you from this house and treating you as if you were in your senses, I shall have to inflict such a punishment on it as will be remembered for ages and ages. Amen. Dost thou not know, thou miserable little licentiate, that I can do it, being, as I say, Jupiter the Thunderer, who hold in my hands the fiery bolts with which I am able and am wont to threaten and lay waste the world? But in one way only will I punish this ignorant town, and that is by not raining upon it, nor on any part of this district or territory for three whole years, to be reckoned from the day and moment when this threat is pronounced. Thou free, thou cure, thou in thy senses, and I mad, I disordered, I bound, 
I will as soon think of sending rain as of hanging myself. Those present stood listening to the words and exclamations of the madman, but our licentiate, turning to the chaplain and seizing him by the hands, said to him, Be not uneasy, senor. Attach no importance to what this madman has said, for if he is Jupiter and will not send rain, I, who am Neptune, the father and god of the waters, will rain as often as it pleases me and may be needful. The governor and the bystanders laughed, and at their laughter the chaplain was half ashamed, and he replied, For all that, Senor Neptune, it will not do to vex Senor Jupiter. Remain where you are, and some other day, when there is a better opportunity and more time, we will come back for you. So they stripped the licentiate, and he was left where he was. And that's the end of the story. So that's the story, Master Barber, said Don Quixote, which came in so pat to the purpose that you could not help telling it. Master Shaver, Master Shaver, how blind is he who cannot see through a sieve? Is it possible that you do not know that comparisons of wit with wit, valor with valor, Beauty with beauty, birth with birth, are always odious and unwelcome. I, Master Barber, am not Neptune, the god of the waters, nor do I try to make anyone take me for an astute man, for I am not one. My only endeavor is to convince the world of the mistake it makes in not reviving in itself the happy time when the order of knight-errantry was in the field. But our depraved age does not deserve to enjoy such a blessing as those ages enjoyed when knights errants took upon their shoulders the defense of kingdoms, the protection of damsels, the succor of orphans and minors, the chastisement of the proud, and the recompense of the humble. With the knights of these days, for the most part, it is the damask, brocade, and rich stuffs they wear that rustle as they go not the chain mail of their armor. No knight nowadays sleeps in the open field, exposed to the inclemency of heaven, and in full panoply from head to foot. No one now takes a nap, as they call it, without drawing his feet out of the stirrups and leaning upon his lance, as the knights errants used to do. No one now, issuing from the wood, penetrates yonder mountains, and then treads the barren, lonely shore of the sea, mostly a tempestuous and stormy one, and finding on the beach a little bark without oars, sail, mast, or tackling of any kind, in the intrepidity of his heart flings himself into it and commits himself to the wrathful billows of the deep sea, that one moment lift him up to heaven and the next plunge him into the depths and, opposing his breast to the irresistible gale, finds himself, when he least expects it, three thousand leagues and more away from the place where he embarked. And, leaping ashore in a remote and unknown land, has adventures that deserve to be written, not on parchment, but on brass. But now sloth triumphs over energy, indolence over exertion, vice over virtue, arrogance over courage, and the theory over practice in arms, which flourished and shone only in the golden ages and in knights errant. For tell me, who was more virtuous and more valiant than the famous Amadis of Gaul? Who more discreet than Palmerin of England? Who more gracious and easy than Tirante el Blanco? Who more curtly than Lisuarte of Greece? Who more slashed or slashing than Don Belianis? Who more intrepid than Perion of Gaul? Who more ready to face danger than Felix Marte of Ircania? Who more sincere than Esplandian? Who more impetuous than Don Cirongilio of Thrace? Who more bold than Rodamonte? Who more prudent than King Sobrino? Who more daring than Reynaldos? Who more invincible than Roland? 
and who more gallant and courteous than Ruggiero, from whom the dukes of Ferrara of the present day are descended? According to Turpin in his cosmography. All these knights, and many more that I could name, Signor Curate, were knights errant, the light and glory of chivalry. These, or such as these, I would have to carry out my plan, and in that case His Majesty would find himself well served and would save great expense, and the Turk would be left tearing his beard. And so I will stay where I am, as the chaplain does not take me away. And if Jupiter, as the barber has told us, will not send rain, here I am, and I will rain when I please. I say this that Master Basin may know that I understand him. Indeed, Senor Don Quixote, said the barber, I did not mean it in that way, and so help me God, my intention was good, and your worship ought not to be vexed. As to whether I ought to be vexed or not, returned Don Quixote, I myself am the best judge. Hereupon the curate observed, I have hardly said a word as yet, and I would gladly be relieved of a doubt, arising from what Don Quixote has said, that worries and works my conscience. The Señor Curate has leave for more than that, returned Don Quixote, so he may declare his doubt, for it is not pleasant to have a doubt on one's conscience. Well, then, with that permission, said the curate, I say my doubt is that all I can do, I cannot persuade myself that the whole pack of knights errants you, Señor Don Quixote, have mentioned, were really and truly persons of flesh and blood that ever lived in the world. On the contrary, I suspect it to be all fiction fable and falsehood and dreams told by men awakened from sleep or rather still half asleep that is another mistake replied don quixote into which many have fallen who do not believe that there were ever such knights in the world and i have often with diverse people and on diverse occasions tried to expose this almost universal error to the light of truth Sometimes I have not been successful in my purpose, sometimes I have, supporting it upon the shoulders of the truth, which truth is so clear that I can almost say I have with my own eyes seen Amadis of Gaul, who was a man of lofty stature, fair complexion, with a handsome, tough, black beard of a countenance between gentle and stern in expression, sparing of words, slow to anger and quick to put it away from him and as i have depicted amadis so i could i think portray and describe all the knights errant that are in all the histories in the world for by the perception i have that they were what their histories describe and by the deeds they did and the dispositions they displayed it is possible with the aid of sound philosophy, to deduce their features, complexion, and stature. How big in your worship's opinion may the giant Morgante have been, Señor Don Quixote? asked the barber. With regard to giants, replied Don Quixote, opinions differ as to whether there ever were any or not in the world. But the Holy Scripture, which cannot err by a jot from the truth, shows us that there were, when it gives us the history of that big Philistine Goliath, who was seven cubits and a half in height, which is a huge size. Likewise, in the island of Sicily, there have been found leg bones and arm bones so large that their size makes it plain that their owners were giants and as tall as great towers. Geometry puts this fact beyond a doubt. But, for all that, I cannot speak with certainty as to the size of Morgante, though I suspect he cannot have been very tall, and I am inclined to be of this opinion, because I find in the history in which his deeds are particularly mentioned, 
that he frequently slept under a roof, and as he found houses to contain him, it is clear that his bulk could not have been anything excessive. That is true, said the curate, and yielding to the enjoyment of hearing such nonsense, he asked him what was his notion of the features of Reinaldos of Montalban, and Don Roland, and the rest of the twelve peers of France, for they were all knights errant. As for Reinaldos, replied Don Quixote, I venture to say that he was broad-faced, of ruddy complexion, with roguish and somewhat prominent eyes, excessively punctilious and touchy, and given to the society of thieves and scapegraces. With regard to Roland, or Rotolando, or Orlando, for the histories call him by all these names, I am of opinion and hold that he was of middle height, broad-shouldered, rather bow-legged, swarthy complexioned, red-bearded, with a hairy body and a severe expression of countenance, a man of few words, but very polite and well-bred. If Roland was not a more graceful person than your worship has described, said the curate, it is no wonder that the fair lady Angelica rejected him and left him for the gaiety, liveliness, and grace of that of budding bearded little Moor to whom she surrendered herself, and she showed her sense in falling in love with the gentle softness of Medoro rather than the roughness of Roland. That Angelica, Signor Curate, returned Don Quixote, was a giddy damsel, flighty and somewhat wanton and she left the world as full of her vagaries as of the fame of her beauty she treated with scorn a thousand gentlemen men of valour and wisdom and took up with a smooth-faced sprig of a page without fortune or fame except such reputation for gratitude as the affection he bore his friend got for him the great poet who sang her beauty the famous ariosto not caring to sing her adventures after her contemptible surrender, which probably were not over and above creditable, dropped her where he says, How she received the scepter of Cathay, some bard of defter quill may sing some day. And this was no doubt a kind of prophecy, for poets are also called vates, that is to say diviners, and its truth was made plain, for since then a famous Andalusian poet has lamented and sung her tears, and another famous and rare poet, a Castilian, has sung her beauty. Tell me, Señor Don Quixote, said the barber here, among all those who praised her, has there been no poet to write a satire on this lady Angelica? I can well believe, replied Don Quixote, that if Sacripante or Roland had been poets, they would have given the damsel a trimming, for it is naturally the way with poets who have been scorned and rejected by their ladies, whether fictitious or not, in short, by those whom they select as the ladies of their thoughts, to avenge themselves in satires and libels, a vengeance to be sure unworthy of generous hearts but up to the present i have not heard of any defamatory verse against the lady angelica who turned the world upside down strange said the curate but at this moment they heard the housekeeper and the niece who had previously withdrawn from the conversation exclaiming aloud in the courtyard and at the noise they all ran out End of chapter one Of Don Quixote, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Don Quixote, Volume 2. By Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. Translated by John Ormsby. Chapter 2. Which treats of the notable altercation 
which Sancho Panza had with Don Quixote's niece and housekeeper, together with other droll matters. The history relates that the outcry Don Quixote, the curate, and the barber heard came from the niece and the housekeeper exclaiming to Sancho, who was striving to force his way in to see Don Quixote, while they held the door against him. "'What does the vagabond want in this house? Be off to your own, brother, for it is you and no one else that delude my master and lead him astray and take him tramping about the country.' To which Sancho replied, "'Devil's own housekeeper, it is I who am deluded and led astray and taken tramping about the country, and not thy master. He has carried me all over the world, and you are mightily mistaken. He enticed me away from home by a trick, promising me an island, which I am still waiting for. May evil islands choke thee, thou detestable Sancho, said the niece. What are islands? Is it something to eat, glutton and gormandizer that thou art? It is not something to eat, replied Sancho, but something to govern and rule, and better than four cities or four judgeships at court. For all that, said the housekeeper, you don't enter here, you bag of mischief and sack of knavery. Go govern your house and dig your seed patch and give over looking for islands or shylands. The curate and the barber listened with great amusement to the words of the three, but Don Quixote, uneasy lest Sancho should blab and blurt out a whole heap of mischievous stupidities, and touch upon points that might not be altogether to his credit, called to him and made the other two hold their tongues, and let him come in. Sancho entered, and the curate and the barber took their leave of Don Quixote of whose recovery they despaired when they saw how wedded he was to his crazy ideas, and how saturated with the nonsense of his unlucky chivalry, and said the curate to the barber, You will see, gossip, that when we are least thinking of it, our gentleman will be off once more for another flight. I have no doubt of it returned the barber, but I do not wonder so much at the madness of the knight as at the simplicity of the squire, who has such a firm belief in all that about the island, that I suppose all the exposures that could be imagined would not get it out of his head. God help them, said the curate, and let us be on the lookout to see what comes of all these absurdities of the knight and the squire, for it seems as if they had both been cast in the same mould, and the madness of the master, without the simplicity of the man, would not be worth a farthing. That is true, said the barber, and I should like very much to know what the pair are talking about at this very moment. I promise you, said the curate, the niece or the housekeeper will tell us by and by, for they are not the ones to forget to listen. Meanwhile, Don Quixote shut himself up in his room with Sancho, and when they were alone he said to him, It grieves me greatly, Sancho, that thou shouldst have said and sayest that I took thee out of thy cottage when thou knowest I did not remain in my house, we sallied forth together, we took the road together, we wandered abroad together, we have had the same fortune and the same luck. If they blanketed thee once, they belabored me a hundred times, and that is the only advantage I have of thee. That was only reasonable, replied Sancho, for by what your worship says, Misfortunes belong more properly to knights errant than to their squires. Thou art mistaken, Sancho, said Don Quixote, according to the maxim uh, quando caput dolet, etc. I don't understand any language but my own, said Sancho. I mean to say, said Don Quixote, that when the head suffers, all the members suffer, and so, being thy lord and master, I am thy head, and thou a part of me, as thou art my servant, and therefore any evil that affects or shall affect me should give thee pain, and what affects thee 
give pain to me. It should be so, said Sancho, but when I was blanketed as a member, my head was on the other side of the wall, looking on while I was flying through the air, and did not feel any pain whatever, and if the members are obliged to feel the suffering of the head, it should be obliged to feel their sufferings. Dost thou mean to say, Sancho, said Don Quixote, that I did not feel when they were blanketing thee? If thou dost, thou must not say so or think so, for I felt more pain then in spirit than thou didst in body. But let us put that aside for the present, for we shall have opportunities enough for considering and settling the point. Tell me, Sancho, my friend, what do they say about me in the village here? What do the common people think of me? What do the hidalgos, what do the caballeros, what do they say of my valor, of my achievements, of my courtesy? How do they treat the task I have undertaken in reviving and restoring to the world the now forgotten order of chivalry? In short, Sancho, I would have thee tell me all that has come to thine ears on this subject, and thou art to tell me, without adding anything to the good, or taking away anything from the bad, for it is the duty of loyal vassals to tell the truth to their lords, just as it is and in its proper shape, not allowing flattery to add to it, or any idle deference to lessen it. And I would have thee know, Sancho, that if the naked truth undisguised by flattery, came to the ears of princes, times would be different, and other ages would be reckoned iron ages more than ours, which I hold to be the golden of these latter days. Profit by this advice, Sancho, and report to me clearly and faithfully the truth of what thou knowest, touching what I have demanded of thee. That I will do with all my heart, master, replied Sancho, provided your worship will not be vexed at what I say, as you wish me to say it out in all its nakedness, without putting any more clothes on it than it came to my knowledge in. I will not be vexed at all, returned Don Quixote. Thou mayest speak freely, Sancho, and without any beating about the bush. Well, then said he, first of all, I have to tell you that the common people consider your worship a mighty great madman, and me no less a fool. The hidalgos say that, not keeping within the bounds of your quality of gentleman, you have assumed the don, and made a knight of yourself at a jump, with four vine stalks and a couple of acres of land, and never a shirt to your back. The caballeros say they do not want to have hidalgos setting up in opposition to them, particularly squire hidalgos who polish their own shoes and darn their black stockings with green silk. That, said Don Quixote, does not apply to me, for I always go well dressed and never patched. Ragged I may be, but ragged more from the wear and tear of arms than of time. As to your worship's valor, courtesy, accomplishments, and task, there is a variety of opinions. Some say, mad, but droll. Others, valiant, but unlucky. Others, courteous, but meddling. And then they go into such a number of things that they don't leave a whole bone either in your worship or in myself. Recollect, Sancho, said Don Quixote, that wherever virtue exists, in an eminent degree, it is persecuted. Few or none of the famous men that have lived escaped being calumniated by malice. Julius Caesar boldest, wisest, and bravest of captains, was charged with being ambitious, and not particularly cleanly in his dress, or pure in his morals. Of Alexander, whose deeds won him the name of great, 
they say that he was somewhat of a drunkard. Of Hercules, him of the many labors, it is said that he was lewd and luxurious. Of Don Galor, the brother of Amadis of Gaul, it was whispered that he was over-quarrelsome, and of his brother that he was lacrimose, so that, O oh Sancho, amongst all these calumnies against good men, mine may let be pass, since they are no more than thou hast said. That's just where it is, body of my father. Is there more, then? asked Don Quixote. There's the tail to be skinned yet, said Sancho. All so far is cakes and fancy bread, but if your worship wants to know all about the calumnies they bring against you, I will fetch you one this instant who can tell you the whole of them without missing an atom. For last night the son of Bartholomew Carrasco, who has been studying at Salamanca, came home after having been made a bachelor, and when I went to welcome him, he told me that your worship's history is already abroad in books with the title of The Ingenious Gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha, and he says they mention me in it by my own name of Sancho Panza, and the Lady Dulcinea del Tobasco too, and diverse things that happened to us when we were alone, so that I crossed myself in my wonder how the historian who wrote them down could have known them. I promise thee, Sancho, said Don Quixote, the author of our history will be some sage enchanter, for to such nothing that they choose to write about is hidden. What? said Sancho. A sage and an enchanter? Why, the bachelor Samson Carrasco, that is the name of him I spoke of, says the author of the history is called Cide Hamete Perenhena. That is a Moorish name, said Don Quixote. Maybe so, replied Sancho, for I have heard that the Moors are mostly great lovers of Berenjenas. Thou must have mistaken the surname of this Cide, which means in Arabic Lord, Sancho observed Don Quixote. Very likely, replied Sancho, but if your worship wishes me to fetch the bachelor, I will go for him in a twinkling. Thou wilt do me a great pleasure, my friend, said Don Quixote, for what thou hast told me has amazed me, and I shall not eat a morsel that will agree with me until I have heard all about it. Then I am off for him, said Sancho and leaving his master he went in quest of the bachelor, with whom he returned in a short time, and all three together they had a very droll colloquy. End of chapter. Chapter 3 Of the laughable conversation that passed between Don Quixote, Sancho Panza, and the bachelor Samson Carrasco. Don Quixote remained very deep in thought, waiting for the bachelor Carrasco, from whom he was to hear how he himself had been put into a book, as Sancho said, and he could not persuade himself that any such history could be in existence, for the blood of the enemies he had slain was not yet dry on the blade of his sword, and now they wanted to make out that his mighty achievements were going about in print. For all that, he fancied some sage, either a friend or an enemy, might, by the aid of magic, have given them to the press, if a friend, in order to magnify and exalt them above the most famous ever achieved by any knight-errant, if an enemy, to bring them to naught and degrade them below the meanest ever recorded of any low squire, though, as he said to himself, the achievements of squires never were recorded. If, however, it were the fact that such a history were in existence, it must necessarily, being the story of a knight-errant, be grandiloquent, lofty, imposing, grand and true. With this he comforted himself somewhat, though it made him uncomfortable to think that the author was a moor, judging by the title of Cide, and that no truth was to be looked for from moors, as they are all impostors, cheats and schemers. 
he was afraid he might have dealt with his love affairs in some indecorous fashion that might tend to the discredit and prejudice of the purity of his lady Dulcinea del Tobasco. He would have had him set forth the fidelity and respect he had always observed toward her, spurning queens, empresses, and damsels of all sorts, and keeping in check the impetuosity of his natural impulses. Absorbed and wrapped up in these and diverse other cogitations, he was found by Sancho and Carrasco, whom Don Quixote received with great courtesy. The bachelor, though he was called Samson, was of no great bodily size, but he was a very great wag. He was of a sallow complexion, but very sharp-witted, somewhere about four-and-twenty years of age, with a round face, a flat nose, and a large mouth all indications of a mischievous disposition, and a love of fun and jokes, and of this he gave a sample as soon as he saw Don Quixote, by falling on his knees before him and saying, Let me kiss your mightiness's hand, Signor Don Quixote of La Mancha, for by the habit of St. Peter that I wear, though I have no more than the first four orders, your worship is one of the most famous knights errant that have ever been or will be all the world over. A blessing on Sidi Hermete de Benengheli, who has written the history of your great deeds, and a double blessing on that connoisseur who took the trouble of having it translated out of the Arabic into our Castilian vulgar tongue for the universal entertainment of the people. Don Quixote made him rise and said, so, then, it is true that there is a history of me, and that it was a moor and a sage who wrote it? So true it is, Signor, said Samson, that my belief is there are more than twelve thousand volumes of said history in print this very day. Only ask Portugal, Barcelona, and Valencia, where they have been printed, and moreover there is a report that it is being printed in Antwerp, and I am persuaded there will not be a country or language in which there will not be a translation of it. One of the things, here observed Don Quixote, that ought to give the most pleasure to a virtuous and eminent man is to find himself in his lifetime in print and in type, familiar in people's mouths with a good name. I say with a good name, for if it be the opposite, then there is no death to be compared to it. If it goes by good name and fame, said the bachelor, your worship alone bears away the palm from all the knights errant, for the moor in his own language and the Christian in his have taken care to set before us your gallantry, your high courage in encountering dangers, your fortitude in adversity, your patience under misfortunes as well as wounds, the purity and continence of the platonic loves of your worship and my lady Dona Dulcinea del Tobasco. I never heard my lady Dulcinea called Dona, observed Sancho here, nothing more than the lady Dulcinea del Tobasco. So here already the history is wrong. That is not an objection of any importance, replied Carrasco. Certainly not, said Don Quixote, but tell me, Signor Bachelor, what deeds of mine are they that are most made of in this history? On that point, replied the bachelor, opinions differ, as tastes do. Some swear by the adventure of the windmills that your worship took to be Briarusus and giants, others by that of the fulling mills. One cries up the description of the two armies that afterwards took the appearance of droves of sheep, another that of the dead body on its way to be buried at Segovia. A third says the liberation of the galley slaves is the best of all, and a fourth that nothing comes up to the affair with the Benedictine giants and the battle with the valiant Biscayan. Tell me, Signor Bachelor, said Sancho at this point, does the adventure with the Yangusans come in when our good Rocinante went hankering after dainties? The sage has left nothing in the ink bottle, replied Samson. He tells all and sets down everything, even to the capers that worthy Sancho cut in the blanket. I cut no capers in the blanket, returned Sancho. In the air I did, and more of them than I liked. 
"'There is no human history in the world, I suppose,' said Don Quixote, "'that has not its ups and downs, but more than others such as deal with chivalry, "'for they can never be entirely made up of prosperous adventures.' "'For all that,' replied the bachelor, "'there are those who have read the history who say "'they would have been glad if the author had left out "'some of the countless cudgelings that were inflicted on Signor Don Quixote "'in various encounters.' "'That's where the truth of the history comes in,' said Sancho. "'At the same time they might fairly have passed them over in silence,' "'observed Don Quixote.' for there is no need of recording events which do not change or affect the truth of a history, if they tend to bring the hero of it into contempt. Aeneas was not in truth and earnest so pious as Virgil represents him, nor Ulysses so wise as Homer describes him. That is true, said Samson, but it is one thing to write as a poet, another to write as a historian. The poet may describe or sing things not as they were, but as they ought to have been. But the historian has to write them down not as they ought to have been, but as they were, without adding anything to the truth or taking anything from it. Well then, said Sancho, if this senior Moor goes in for telling the truth, no doubt among my master's drubbings mine are to be found for they never took the measure of his worship's shoulders without doing the same for my whole body. But I have no right to wonder at that, for, as my master says, the members must share the pain of the head. You are a sly dog, Sancho, said Don Quixote. In faith, you have no want of memory when you choose to remember. If I were to try to forget the thwacks they gave me, said Sancho, my wheels would not let me, for they are still fresh on my ribs. Hush, Sancho, said Don Quixote, and don't interrupt the bachelor, whom I entreat to go on and tell all that is said about me in this history. And about me, said Sancho, for they say too that I am one of the principal personages in it. Personages, not personages, friend Sancho, said Samson. What? Another word-catcher? said Sancho. If that's to be the way, we shall not make an end in a lifetime. May God shorten mine, Sancho, returned the bachelor, if you are not the second person in the history. And there are even some who would rather hear you talk than the cleverest in the whole book, though there are some, too, who say you showed yourself over-credulous in believing that there was any possibility in the government of that island offered you by Signor Don Quixote. There is still sunshine on that wall, said Don Quixote, and when Sancho is somewhat more advanced in life, with the experience that years bring, he will be fitter and better qualified for being a governor than he is at present. By God, master, said Sancho, the island that I cannot govern with the years I have, I'll not be able to govern with the years of Methuselah. The difficulty is that the said island keeps its distance somewhere, I know not where, and not that there is any want of a head in me to govern it. Leave it to God, Sancho, said Don Quixote, for all will be, and perhaps better than you think, no leaf on the tree stirs but by God's will. "'That is true,' said Samson, "'and if it be God's will, "'there will not be any want of a thousand islands, "'much less one, for Sancho to govern. "'I have seen governors in these parts,' said Sancho, "'that are not to be compared to my shoe-sole, "'and for all that they are called your lordship "'and served on silver.' "'Those are not governors of islands,' observed Samson, "'but of other governments of an easier kind.' Those that govern islands must at least know grammar. I could manage the gram well enough, said Sancho, but for the mar I have neither leaning nor liking, for I don't know what it is. But leaving this matter of the government in God's hands, to send me wherever it may be most to his service, I may tell you, Signor Bachelor Samson Carrasco, it has pleased me beyond measure that the author of this history should have spoken of me in such a way that what is said of me gives no offence, 
for on the faith of a true squire if he had said anything about me that was at all unbecoming an old christian such as i am the deaf would have heard of it that would be working miracles said samson miracles or no miracles said sancho let every one mind how he speaks or writes about people and not set down at random the first thing that comes into his head one of the faults they find with this history said the bachelor is that its author inserted it in a novel called the ill-advised curiosity not that it is bad or ill-told but that it is out of place and nothing to do with the history of his worship senor don quixote i will bet the son of a dog has mixed the cabbages and the baskets said sancho then i say said don quixote the author of my history was no sage but some ignorant chatterer who in a haphazard and heedless way set about writing it let it turn out as it might just as urbaneja the painter of ubeda used to do who when they asked him what he was painting answered what it may turn out sometimes he would paint a cock in such a fashion and so unlike that he had to write alongside of it in gothic letters this is a cock and so it will be with my history which will require a commentary to make it intelligible no fear of that returned samson for it is so plain that there is nothing in it to puzzle over the children turn its leaves the young people read it the grown men understand it the old folks praise it in a word it is so thumbed and read and got by heart by people of all sorts that the instant they see any lean hack they say there goes rocinante and those that are most given to reading it are the pages for there is not a lord's antechamber where there is not a don quixote to be found one takes it up if another lays it down this one pounces upon it and that one begs for it in short the said history is the most delightful and least injurious entertainment that has been hitherto seen for there is not to be found in the whole of it even the semblance of an immodest word or a thought that is other than catholic to write in any other way said don quixote would not be to write truth but falsehood and historians who have recourse to falsehood ought to be burned like those who coin false money and i know not what could have led the author to have recourse to novels and irrelevant stories when he had so much to write about in mine no doubt he must have gone by the proverb with straw or with hay etc for by merely setting forth my thoughts my sighs my tears my lofty purposes my enterprises he might have made a volume as large or larger than all the works of el tostado would make up in fact the conclusion i arrive at senor bachelor is that to write histories or books of any kind there is need of great judgment and a ripe understanding to give expression to humor and write in a strain of graceful pleasantry is the gift of great geniuses the cleverest character in comedy is the clown for he who would make people take him for a fool must not be one history is in a measure a sacred thing for it should be true and where the truth is there god is but notwithstanding this there are some who write and fling books broadcast on the world as if they were fritters there is no book so bad but it has something good in it said the bachelor no doubt of that replied don quixote but it often happens that those who have acquired and attained a well-deserved reputation by their writings lose it entirely or damage it in some degree when they give them to the press the reason of that said samson is that as printed works are examined leisurely their faults are easily seen and the greater the fame of the writer the more closely they are scrutinized men famous for their genius great poets illustrious historians are always or most commonly envied by those who take a particular delight and pleasure in criticizing the writings of others without having produced any of their own that is no wonder said don quixote for there are many divines who are no good for the pulpit but excellent in detecting the defects or excesses of those who preach all that is true senor don quixote 
said Carrasco. "'But I wish such fault-finders were more lenient and less exacting, "'and did not pay so much attention to the spots on the bright sun of the work they grumble at. "'For if aliquando bonus dormitat homeras, "'they should remember how long he remained awake to shed the light of his work "'with as little shade as possible. "'And perhaps it may be that what they find fault with may be moles that sometimes heighten the beauty of the face that bears them. And so I say, very great is the risk to which he who prints a book exposes himself, for of all impossibilities the greatest is to write one that will satisfy and please all readers. That which treats of me must have pleased few, said Don Quixote. Quite the contrary, said the bachelor, for as Strutorum infinitum est numeris, innumerable are those who have relished the said history, but some have brought a charge against the author's memory, inasmuch as he forgot to say who the thief was who stole Sancho's dapple, for it is not stated there, but only to be inferred from what is set down, that he was stolen, and a little farther on we see Sancho mounted on the same ass without any reappearance of it. They say, too, that he forgot to state what Sancho did with those hundred crowns that he found in the valise of Sierra Morena, as he never alludes to them again, and there are many who would be glad to know what he did with them, or what he spent them on, for it is one of the serious omissions of the work. Signor Samson, I am not in a humor now for going into accounts or explanations, said Sancho, for there is a sinking of the stomach come over me, and unless I doctor it with a couple of sups of the old stuff, it will put me on the thorn of Santa Lucia. I have it at home, and my old woman is waiting for me. After dinner I will come back and will answer you and all the world every question you may choose to ask as well about the loss of the ass as about the spending of the hundred crowns. And without another word, or waiting for a reply, he made off home. Don Quixote begged and entreated the bachelor to stay and do penance with him. The bachelor accepted the invitation and remained. A couple of young pigeons were added to the ordinary fare. At dinner they talked chivalry. Carrasco fell in with his host's humor, the banquet came to an end, they took their afternoon sleep, Sancho returned, and their conversation was resumed. End of chapter 3 Reading by Tisto, tysto.com